everybody, I'm here with Lady Brenda, and we are here to remind you that you have one week left to register to sponsor a child for Gifts for Kids. You can go online at ehtonline.org, press the registration button, and scroll gifts down. For kids. Scroll down for Gifts for Kids. Just click the Gifts for Kids button right at the top. You can bypass registration. Just click Gifts for Kids, then click Sponsor, and then you're good to go. And pick out your child. And if you don't want to pick out a child and you simply want to sponsor, all you need to do is send a love gift, and we will be sure to buy the gift for you for a specific child. You can do that part right in your regular tithe and offering giving. If you have any more questions, you can call us at the church, 781-284-0670, or send us a message here on Facebook. And we are looking forward to you joining us in this community outreach. Hope you like our ugly sweaters. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. I want to remind you that you can register to attend in person by visiting us at ehconline.org for one of three services at 8.30, 10.15, or 12 p.m. If you are unable to attend in person, you can continue to live stream with us right here at 8.30 and 10.15. Now join us for today's message from Bishop James E. Collins. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is anybody awake out there? Come on, let's welcome the Spirit of the Lord in this building. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much that you are a good God. Lord, even in the midst of tragedy and mess, Lord, you are still a good God. Lord, before we were, you already existed. And when we don't, you will always exist. So, God, we give you glory. Father, we pray today, Lord, as your word comes in like a sword, Lord, that it would cut through anything that's not like you. And God, that you would move in us in a way that we've never seen before. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you're about to do in this room. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody that loves God say, Amen. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. There's a feeling in the air. God is everywhere. Amen. Amen. Well, glory to God in your Bibles in Luke 1. I want to continue in this series about Christmas questions. And I want to start by asking you this day, is your God the God of the impossible? Luke 1, 26 through 35. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed art you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Impossible moving God. The one who moves the impossible, not only just to the possible, but turns it into miracle working power. Perform your word in our hearts today. Lord, where we're shaking, strengthen the foundation. Where we become that people who no matter what we see around us, we are confident that our God is the God of the impossible. And that no matter what we go through in life, we are blessed and highly favored. For you are with us. Now, Father, cause this word to spring up into life. And I thank you it's going to happen in every heart. Because I pray for it and I believe for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 
You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As you know that last week I began to talk about the reality that there are some words that have literally lost their meaning because they have been so frivolously thrown around, they've lost meaning today. We learned that the word blessed is one of them. I want to talk to you about another one of those words. It is the word miracle. You go on the search web and you ask for the definition of what constitutes a miracle and you get all kinds of answers. Some of them are good answers, but a whole lot of them are really whacked out answers. One author defined a miracle like this. What is a miracle? The definition of a miracle is correction of perception. The prayer for a miracle merely reminds that what is perceived is false. The miracles of Jesus actually occur at the mind level rather than at the physical level. In practice, the healing miracle is for the mind and is always felt. It may or may not have apparent external manifestations. The power of the one mind transcends limitations and there is no order of difficulties in miracles. So then the person asks the question. So then, thus, the key to miracles is a willingness to suspend the meaning you have given to something and look upon it in another way. Change of perception, that is the mechanism of the miracle. And the author responds by saying, yes, you might say miracles are the means of awakening. They always involve perception. Now let me say something. There are some serious flaws and there is some truth in those statements. And I'm not here to debate which is the issue, but simply to say this. The definition of a miracle and the fulfillment of a miracle are a whole lot more than merely a change of perception. Chris Samens of Pro Ministries gives us this biblical definition of a miracle. Listen to this. The term miracle has lost much of its luster in our day, and it isn't because we see miracles taking place so often that we no longer are sensitive to their meaning. It is because our speech has evolved in such a way that today, if I got to work on time this morning, it was a miracle that I made it, seeing that there was so much traffic on the freeway. Not everything hard to believe can be qualified as a miracle according to the scriptural standards. Miracles are those acts that God can perform and only God can perform, usually superseding natural laws. Let me give you an illustration of how easy it is to see something as a miracle that is really not a miracle. ChristianPost.com shared this story. Baby born at 28 years old sets record for birth of frozen embryo. Molly Everett Gibson is the first baby born at 28 years old, but she won't be the last, according to Mark Mellinger of the National Embryo Donation Center. Before she was born, Molly was frozen by her genetic parents for more than 27 years. They donated her as an embryo to the NEDC so she could be born to another set of parents. Molly is described as a healthy infant who weighed six pounds, 13 ounces, and measured 19 inches long at birth. Based on her embryonic age, she is 28 since her embryo was frozen on October 14, 1992. Now watch this. The article goes on to say, To help couples who are unable to conceive, doctors unite the eggs and the sperm of couples in laboratories to create embryos. Roughly one million embryos wait frozen across the United States, according to the NEDC. Now let me show you something that happens when man's hand gets involved in something that only God should be doing. Molly's older biological sister, watch now, Emma Wren Gibson, was also frozen before her birth, born three years before for Molly, she was frozen for 24 years. Now understand what I just said. What they're saying is that her older sister is actually younger than she is. And listen, church, there are Christians who are on both sides of the moral balance, some who support this and some who don't. But here is what I want you to grab. Mellinger goes on to say, I have heard our embryologist, Carol Sommerfeld, talk about how extremely humbling it is. She has a real heart for this. She has said many Many times I see miracles happening every day. Listen to me very closely. Again, I don't care about what side you are on this. This is amazing, but it is not a miracle. Let me just say something. Nothing is a miracle when men have the power to control it. 
What qualifies as a miracle is that which the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary that day. That which, if God does not come on the scene, it is a verifiable impossibility. That that can only happen when the Holy Spirit of God begins to move on the scene, then that which is impossible becomes possible. And I want to ask you again this Christmas season, is your God the God of the impossible? Let me ask you a question today. Do you believe that the God you serve, the God that I serve, our God is a miracle working God, not just in principle because you have heard so or you have read so, but in practice because you have come to the place to the degree where you have tried him and you know for yourself nobody can talk you into it they can't talk you out of it because you know for yourself that your God is a miracle working God now now stay with me just for a moment and then we'll take some notes 2,000 plus years ago there was a miracle that involved a baby when Mary asked the angel how the possible would be impossible will become possible He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That overshadow means he's going to hover. He's going to stay around until he changes the equation. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Dr. Frank Turnstall gives us this powerful truth and illustration. He says this, to make the incarnation happen, God becoming man, it was the job description of the Holy Spirit to serve as the power source. The incarnation of Jesus, defined as becoming man, a human being without question, is one of the greatest miracles of all time. The modern day discovery of DNA arguably illustrates how it might have happened. Now watch this. Joseph had no union with Mary until she gave birth to Jesus. Mary conceived because of this overshadowing that Luke described. It refers to the Holy Spirit hovering, and he hovers like in Genesis 1 and 2 over the water. In contemporary language, it can be pictured as the genetic structure, the DNA supplied by a father in conception. Now listen closely. In baby Jesus' case, Mary was a virgin. This meant that the father's contribution to Jesus' DNA had to be created with its billions of invisible cells and nuclei. Only then could baby Jesus come into the world both truly as a human and as God's son. Now bear with me just for a few moments, church. Johannes Kepler, 1536 to 1630, was a German scientist an astronomer, a mathematician, and a trained Lutheran theologian. He understood his work as thinking the thoughts of God after him. DNA is the term that describes billions of microscopic sized molecules that hold in their nuclei the instructions an infant must have to develop fully and to live healthily and reproduce. Watch this, church. In this sense, DNA is the discovery of the building blocks of life. Stay with it now. These directives are found inside every human molecule and are handed down from the parents to the children. A full set of genes known as genome includes some 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. Said another way, the DNA formed by the union of a man's and woman's cells contains the commands for a lifetime of orderly growth in their children. Dr. Sternstall goes on to say, If Kepler were living today, he would surely revel thinking about DNA, imagining the thoughts of God after him. For baby Jesus to come into the world truly as a man, it was the job description of the Holy Spirit using this DNA illustration to create miraculously the genetic system. Then baby Jesus could be born without sin, grow up, and move into, watch now, the neighborhood of Adam's seed as one of us sin only expected but not fulfilled God alone and God alone could only do that you need to sit with me for a moment and you need to contemplate the grand miracle of the incarnation and as you do that church as Dr. Turnstall says let yourself consider the sovereign dominion of the Holy Spirit required to make it all happen now watch me now in the incarnation If you will do this, 
When you have absorbed the miraculous power and the divine genius of God revealed, you will have no trouble believing not only all the other miracles in the Bible, but you will have no problem believing God to make the impossible and do miracles in your own life. If you can just see what it took to bring the seed of Jesus into the earth, then you can believe that with God, all things are possible. Let me ask you again today, do you believe that your God is the God of the impossible? Do you believe that with God there is absolutely nothing that is impossible? And so, now in Mark 9, 23, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It is there that a man brings his son to Jesus, hoping to his disciples, hoping for a miracle. This boy is in a deplorable condition. This boy is such under such control of a demonic spirit that it causes him to have convulsions. The Bible says that it would take him and it would throw him around and it would thrash his body and then it would leave him on the ground wallowing and foaming at the mouth. And the man watched as his disciples could do nothing and so he implores Jesus to do something for his boy and he says, I brought him to your disciples but they were of no help. And I love the way Jesus responds. He says, well, just bring the boy to me. And he healed the boy, but he grabbed what Jesus said before that. Before he healed the boy, he says to the father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, the Greek word for believe is the word pistuio. It means not many things, but it also means to have a right view of God who is and what God can do. Now, watch this. Then to that one who has a right view of God, Nothing shall be impossible. I want to ask you again. Is your God the God of the impossible? And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, of course, Bishop, we serve the same God that you and every other Christian serve. Let me talk to you for a minute. While we all serve the same God, we don't all have the same view of God. Watch now. And how you view God determines whether you will receive a miracle in your life more than anything else. Let me talk to you for a minute. The way you see God determines what God can do for you. Because how you view God determines how much and how far you will trust him. Because your view of God will decide if you will give Jesus, his son, complete rule and authority over every area of your life in every situation. Because the only way to free the Holy Spirit to work freely in our lives is to make Jesus Lord of all. Now, hold on for a second, because I'm going to get back to that in a moment. I'm going to say it again. When you you have need of a miracle in your life. How you view God is more important than anything else. Let me ask you again in this Christmas season, is your God the God of the impossible? And so let's look at some of the various views that Christians have of God. Now, now, now this is important because we're always looking at how the world views God. I want us to look at how many times we Christians view God. Some view him as an immaterial God. When I say immaterial, I'm talking about seeing him, watch now, of no substantial consequence. In other words, yes, I'm saved, but his word and obedience to his word and him guiding my life, I have no need of that. There are those who want his eternal life, but they don't want his guidance. They want the gift of the blessing and the favor, but don't rule and direct me, God. They desire his fatherhood, but not the authority of the father in their life. Now, let me go back to what I said earlier. Those who view God as immaterial, they think they are in charge of their life. But you need to understand this. If he is not Lord of your life, you can say he's Lord all you want. But if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Now let me talk to you for a minute. Because too many of us confuse him being our Savior as being Lord. Let me help you today. He is your Savior, but if he is not Lord, he is not your Master. He is your Savior, but if he is not Lord, he is not your Ruler. He is Savior 
Savior, but if he is not in charge, he is not your Lord. He is Savior, but if he is not his Lord, here's what I mean. You're going to be saved. You're going to go to heaven. Some of us barely, but he is an immaterial God to you. And because he is, you limit what God can do in your life because you always have to be in control. You got to learn if you want God to do the impossible. You got to learn to yield your right to be in charge. Because again, the Holy Spirit will not force himself on you, nor his will on you. When you have an impossible situation before you in life, believe me, to change the equation, you've got to cooperate with God. That's why Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. Let me tell you what God spoke into my spirit. He says the problem with so many Christians is that we forget that he is the potter and we are the clay. Don't put your hand on me, God. And God says, though, I put my hand on you. It may be painful, but I will mold you and I will shape you after my will. And once you are shaped after my will, will my will and my kingdom will come in your life there was a man who served in a church in Tennessee where an eccentric and flamboyant elder impressed him with her intense commitment to the father and to the faith he said that she didn't have a pietistic bone in her body but her devotion was nonetheless clear and articulate one evening at a dinner party in her home they were animatedly talking and discussing some theological idea in the midst of the give and take, her teenage daughter, probably frustrated with all of the high-blown discussion of religion, asked her mother, Mother, you talk about religion all the time. Why are you so religious? The query brought a loud hush to the dining table. Her mother paused dramatically, pushed her chair back from the table, stood and responded, Every morning before you are awake, I rise and I walk into the living room. I lift up my arms and I ask who's in charge here? And the answer always comes back, not you. That's why I'm religious. She said, because I'm not in charge, religious life begins with the realization that we are not in charge. And from there, we can proceed to align ourselves with the one who is in charge. Let me talk to you for a minute. Too many Christians, we struggle in our walk with God and we put a limit on God of the impossible because he's immaterial to us. And we have this out attitude. We refuse him to have lordship over our lives. And I am telling Telling you, it is one of the greatest obstacles to God doing miracles from them because they always have to be in control. Number two, some view him as an inaccessible God. I'm talking about an unapproachable God. He's out there, and some of them, he's not that far out there. But he's just so big, you can't get close to him. Because he doesn't help the little people listen to me. Some of that belief comes from this wacky prosperity teaching that we have believed down through the years, where you only get special access to God when you give special gifts in his name. Let me talk to you for a minute. While you can't buy a blessing and a favor from God, and while you can't buy a miracle from God, I'm going to say it one more time. It is possible to position yourself for a miracle. And when you have a need in your life, let me tell you the best and the quickest way to get your way out of it, it is to sow a seed. Now stay with me for a moment because not, you don't sow a seed because a man said so. You sow the seed because God said so. Listen to me. When you obey God because God said so, it works. Why does it work? Because when you obey the word of God, you are working the word. And when you work the word, the word works. But here's the point I want to make. Believe me when I tell you this. God looks at the heart of the gift giver and not the size of the gift. Can I just keep saying it until we get it? God does not require equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. But let me show you something. Too many people who think that he is an inaccessible God think that you don't have something big enough to come into his presence. You've heard me tell the story of Jessica and how God healed her of her neurological disorder after we had been to World Harvest and Pastor Rod Parsley gave us the, the handkerchief and he told us to put that under, on, on her and God would heal her. But the part of the story you have not heard was this. Prior to that, we go there and Lady Brenda and I are going there on limited finance. We get there 
and we are down to our last $100. We are in Columbus, Ohio. We live in Erie, Pennsylvania. God speaks to us and says, put that last $100 in the offering, sow a seed toward the need. Now, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, hold on, God. We got a quarter, we got a half a tank of gas. We've got several hours drive in front of us. I got just enough money to fill up the tank. I can't give this $100. God says, put the $100, sow the seed. We sow the seed. We're on our way home. As we're driving home, I did what every man does. I missed the turn onto the highway. I got lost. I didn't listen to Lady Brenda. I told her we're not lost. Once again, we're taking the scenic route home so we can really enjoy the weekend. Well, we enjoyed the scenic route home to the degree that about when we got 100 miles away from home, you could see the needle needling over toward the empty. And I said, oh, God. We did what you told us to do. We sowed that seed. I'm depending on you. We're driving and she's nodding her head because she remembers this. We're driving and we're driving and the thing goes over the empty mark and we're still driving and we're driving and we get home and we drive into the garage and it goes clunk. Totally out of gas. Listen to me very closely. What I'm trying to tell you is that God is an accessible God. He is not an inaccessible God. James says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. He is as close as the mention of his name. That's why I love the Clint Brown song, Say the Name. Mm. I've had times when I needed him that I had run out of words. There have been other times I had plenty of words, but no impetus to get them out. And I just say the name of Jesus. Don't you know on the way home, I just kept saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when I called that name, he made a way even when there seemed to be no way. Thirdly, some view him as an impersonal God. He's not a warm God. He doesn't share any emotion. That he can't possibly understand nor care about what we feel. But I love that Hebrews says that we have a high priest who feels just what we feel. He knows the pain, the challenge, the temptations, the struggles because he was hit with them yet without sin. As long as you view God as an impersonal God, you will never be honest with God. The greatest liar has not lied to you. The greatest liar is within you. We have lied to ourselves. And we have said we trust God, but if we really did, then we would tell him the truth because he already knows it. And when you get honest with God, he'll help you. I'll never forget when Lady Brenda was searching for a biological mother and I, listen to me. I was talking to God one day. And I said, Father, I love you. But this is wrong. See, some of you won't be honest with God because you're scared he's going to hurt you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to hear from you. And I said, God, this is not right. I said, listen, because you have to understand something, that back then and over in the state of Washington, all of the records are sealed. The only way possible for her to have met her mother was that her mother would have to pursue her and then be open to her coming into her life. And I said, God, this is not right. I need you to do something. You, you, you need to, to open up this door. I said, don't you even care? And God says to me, son, I care more than you know. And this will come to pass. And don't you know that personal God told me it would come to pass three years before it ever, ever came to pass. Don't view your God as an impersonal God. He felt her pain. He feels your pain. Number four, some view him as an intolerant God. The God of no patience, merciless, the God who sits on his throne with a hammer in his hand, waiting for you to mess up so that he might squash you like a bug. You see him as a God who is angry and a God who has and gives no mercy. Some of you view him as a Chuck E. Cheese God. Here's what I mean. My favorite game when we would take the girls to Chuck E. Cheese was whack-a-mole. 
you feel like God is a whack-a-mole God. He doesn't let you die because he has too much fun whacking the daylights out of you. One guy had his picture taken. He was so upset at the photographer and very upset at the picture, he rushed back to the photographer. And he said, look at this picture of me. This picture does not do me justice. That photographer looked at him and said, mister, with a face like yours, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> Let me talk to you, God. Talk to your church. God is not an intolerant God. He's a good, gracious, and merciful God. And thank God for Jesus. For because of Jesus, he has not dealt with us as we deserve. We deserve justice, and he gave us mercy instead. Look at me, church. When someone has a loved one who is killed, most of the time, they do not go in and plead for mercy on behalf of the murderer. They go in and they demand justice. Let me tell you something. Do you understand that we deserve justice and not mercy we deserve justice and he gave us mercy first Peter 1 and 3 says praise be to the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade let me illustrate it this way a little boy one day came to his mama and he said mama Make me a peanut butter sandwich, please. Mother made him a peanut butter sandwich, but then he looked at it and he smiled. He said, Mama, I asked you for peanut butter, but you put jelly on it too. Do you know what mercy is, church? Mercy is when God does not just give us what we ask for, but he adds a little bit extra. We ask for a peanut butter sandwich, and he puts a little jelly on it. He gives us more than we deserve. And what far too many of us forget is that he has given us far more than we deserve. We were worthy of death and he gave us life. Number five, some view him as an impervious God. Impervious God, one who is not influenced or affected by something. God looks at this world and he does not care. How many of you know people, you just look at them and you go, do they care about anything or anybody? Some view people, view God this way. They say, for if, if he did, if God is love, and why are so many people suffering through this pandemic? If he were not impervious, why have so many lost loved ones, not only to COVID, but many of them have lost them because they couldn't get the treatment be, for their other illnesses because of those dealing with COVID. There are the ones who wonder if God is not an impervious God then why are there people starving and dying in third world countries? And they constantly ask why, 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 why? And we so often forget in our immaturity, in our relationship with the word of God, that Romans says that the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God, the gift of God is eternal life. He is not an impervious God. It is the reality of the world we live in. And number six, some view him as an impractical God. The one who puts all these guidelines on us called holiness and then fully expects us to try and live up to that stuff. And we go, give me a break. I love him, but he's an impractical God. Nobody can live up to that standard that God places on them. Church, there is what is known as an impracticability law. It means the excuse in performance duty. Under the common law contract, impracticability is a defense relied on when the duty to be performed becomes unfeasibly difficult or expensive for a party to perform. The doctrine of impracticability arises out of the occurrence of a condition which prevents him or her from fulfilling the contract. Here is the problem. In the kingdom of God, there is no impracticability law. There is only the law of God. And the law of God says that I am holy, therefore you be holy. Now listen to me, church. When we came into the kingdom of God, we entered into a contract. It is now called covenant. It is called the word of God. It is called you do your part because God will never fail on his part. And God has bound himself to his word to his covenant and he says for us to do likewise and in that covenant he has written this clause Zechariah 4 and 6 not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord Almighty here is the translation nothing successful in the spirit realm in this kingdom happens through the strength and the power of a man 
all by himself. It is only successful when we learn to live and be led by the Spirit. That's why we spent so many weeks in this church talking about truly being led by the Spirit. For I remind you again that the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 5, 16 through 17, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary to one another, so that you might not do the things you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now, let's take this a step farther. Watch this now. What Paul is saying here is that when we are submitting to and being led by the Spirit, we don't seek nor do we need an impracticability law because we are not under the law. The law is only for those who do not seek to walk in the grace of God. What does the law do? What is the purpose of the law? It is to restrain the hard-headed. When I see a stop sign, it is not binding to me because I'm going to obey the law in the first place. And the reason that I do that is because in my free will I know that I won't get in trouble if I just obey that law. Now watch this. To de be delivered from the power of the law and not be bound by the law are two different things. And the purpose of the grace of God, which is the power of God to work in us, through us, and for us, is to do that which we cannot do for ourselves. And one of them is to live a holy life. Listen to me, church. God is not an impractical, impractical God. He is a holy God. And he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, because I am holy and my standard is so high that you can't reach it by yourself. No temptation will overtake you, but it's common to all of mankind and I am faithful, and I will deliver you out of it if you will be led by my spirit. So number seven, some view him as an inequitable God. He's an unfair God. There are people that argue that God is only good to some and not all. God is a God who favors some over others. And again, why do we think that? Because of some of the teaching we have had from prosperity teachers. I'm going to say it one more time. Matthew 5, 45, Jesus said, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, let me take this a little bit farther than last week. Please understand, this is important, because in this context, what Jesus is actually saying is that the playing field of life, in that playing field of life, the field is level. It is equal whether you are saved or unsaved. Save. Now get, get what I just said. He said the field is level. It's equal. Christian or non-Christian. When you get up in the morning and you walk out your door, when the rain is falling on your face, it is falling on the face of the unbeliever as well. Let me put it another way. When you walk out of your house, I don't care how much you think you're going to pray by faith. If God says it's going to snow, it's going to snow on your yard just like that sinner across the street. Now stay with me just for a moment. When you're your car breaks down, our, or a loved one gets sick, or you lose a job, and whatever thing is happening to you, the Bible says, Jesus says, it is happening to someone else, somewhere else, Christian or not, on the opposite side of the coin. When you get up, and you are so thrilled with the day that you are singing the old Louis Armstrong song, zippity doo -dah. Zippity A. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine heading my way. Zippity dooza. Zippity A. Let me tell you what God says. Jesus says that somebody else who doesn't even know him as Lord and Savior, they are singing the same song. Because in this sin messed up, sin sick world, the good stuff and the bad stuff happens to all people. You don't get to escape it. You don't get to enjoy life without it just because you're a Christian. But here's the difference. As a child of God, you have something I told you last week that the world doesn't have. You are blessed and highly favored in spite of what you're going through. Your God is not an inequitable God. 
And while bad things happen to good people, you are still blessed and highly favored. Because I'm going to remind you one more time of the James 1.12 blessing. Listen to me. After you have endured through trials, after you have been approved, then you shall receive the crown of life. Because if there is anything that we know who have learned to trust God, we know that Job was right when he said to his wife, who said, why don't you curse God and die? He says, woman, you talk like a woman who don't know God. But then he says, yeah, we only say that we are blessed when we are highly favored, when life is easy and not through trials, then not do so in the trials. And then I love what he says, mama, I love you, but I can't do that. But tell me why not, Job? Because number one, Job 20, 23 and 9, I told you last week, he knows the way I take translation. Now let me take this a little bit farther. He is fully aware of what I'm going through because he has allowed it. Now, here's the part we don't like to hear. There are some things in life, church, that just happen and God doesn't allow them. But here's the part we don't like. There are some things in life that happen. God actually orchestrates them. Such was that for Job. Well, but Bishop, you don't understand. That was an Old Testament God. We got a New Testament God. Well, let me tell you about that New Testament God. He told the Apostle Paul, I'm going to send you somewhere and you might as well prepare yourself because when you get over there, there's going to be more trouble waiting for you than you've ever seen in your life. I am trying to tell you today, church, that there are some tests in your life that they are not the devil. They are not other people. They may be being used through other people and the devil, but God has orchestrated them because after you have been tested, if you will stay in there, you will come forth as gold. And i watch this now. So how do I know that you're going to make it, Job? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number two, here's the part I want you to grab. Job 19.25, for I know. Everybody say, I know. For I know my Redeemer lives and he shall stand on the earth. Listen now. And after my skin has been destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. I'm not going to die and go to heaven and see the glory of God. I'm going to see the glory of God right here in this flesh suit. My heart yearns within me. Don't you understand? I am waiting. I am anticipating. I'm not moving by what I feel. I'm moved by what I know. And this I know. My Redeemer lives. Come on, somebody. And after it seems that my life is destroyed and there's no hope, I will stand. After done, I doing everything I know to do to stand. Because of this, I know above all else. I know my Redeemer lives. You can't talk me out of it because you didn't talk me into it. When I was in trouble, he picked my feet up out of the miry clay, put them on the rock, and there I stay, and there I stand. I will see him stand upon the earth for he is not an inequitable God. If I hold on just a little while longer, victory is assured. Now listen to me. The difference in the rain that falls on you and the rain that falls on the unjust is that Jesus Christ changes the equation. Because of him, through the Holy Spirit, you are blessed and highly favored. You may suffer for a little while. But 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, one more time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Come on now. Even in the midst of child, trials, rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, the greater worth than gold, listen, faith is more valuable than gold, which perishes, because see, money will carry you, but it won't keep you, which perishes even through, though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. If you hold on just a little while longer, there will come praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In the midst of the messes of life, he will deliver you. And some view him as an inequitable God because as I close today, some view him as an incapable God. Lacking the necessity, ability, capacity, or power. Incapable of carrying out what he has promised to do. Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. 
The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. John Bevere gives us a great illustration of how capable God is in his book, The Fear of the Lord. I want to give you that illustration. Psalm 8 and 3 says that God's creation is not limited to the earth, but encompasses even the unknown universe. Stay with it now. Beside our sun, the nearest star is 4.3 light years away. So that this number does not remain just a figure, I want to expound on it. Light travels at the speed of 186,282 miles per second, not per hour, church, per second. That is roughly 670 billion miles per hour. Our airplanes fly approximately 500 miles per hour. The moon orbits roughly 239,000 miles from the earth. If we travel by plane to the moon, it would take 19 days, but light reaches there in 1.3 seconds. Now, the sun is 93 million miles from the earth. If, boarded, if we boarded a jumbo jet today and we traveled to the sun, your journey would take over 21 years. That's nonstop too. Let me ask you a question. Where were you 21 years ago? That's a long time ago. Can you imagine flying that long without a moment's break in order to reach the sun? For those who prefer driving, it couldn't be done in a lifetime. It would take roughly 200 years, not including any gas stops. Yet light travels this distance in a mere 8 minutes and 20 seconds. Now, let's leave the sun and move to the nearest star. We already know that it is 4.3 light years from Earth. If we built a scale model of the Earth, Sun, and nearest star, it would be as follows. In proportion, the Earth would reduce to the size of a peppercorn, and the Sun would become the size of an 8-inch diameter ball. According to this scale, the distance from the Earth to the Sun would be 26 yards, which is only a quarter of the length of a football field. Yet remember, for a scale airplane, to span that 26-yard distance, it would take more than 21 years. So if this is the Earth's and Sun's ratio, can you guess how far the nearest star would be from our peppercorn Earth? Would you think a 1,000 yards, 2,000, or maybe a mile? Not even close. Our nearest star would be placed 4,000 miles away from the peppercorn. That means if you put the peppercorn in San Diego, California, the nearest star on our scale model would be positioned past New York City and into the Atlantic Ocean 1,000 miles out to sea. Now, let's go a little further. To reach the closest star by airplane would take approximately 50 billion years non-stop. Yet light from this star travels to Earth in only 4.3 seconds. Watch now. The stars you see at night with a naked eye are 100 to 1,000 light years away. However, there are a few stars you can see with a naked eye that are 4,000 light years away. Think of it. Light travels at a rate of 186,282 miles per second and still takes 4,000 years to reach the earth. Watch this church. That means that the light of these stars was released before Moses parted the Red Sea and has traveled a distance of 670 million miles per hour without slowing down or ceasing and is just now reaching the earth. Let's just pause for a second. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Who wouldn't trust a God like this? But these are only the stars in our galaxy. A galaxy is vast gathering of usually billions of stars. The galaxy in which we live is called the Milky Way. So let's go further. The closest galaxy to ours is the Andromeda Galaxy. Its distance from us is approximately 2.31 million light years away. That's over 2 million light years away. Have we reached the limit of our understanding yet? Watch this now. Scientists estimate there are billions of galaxies, each of them loaded with billions of stars. Now galaxies tend to group together. Andromeda Galaxy and our Milky Way are part of a cluster 
cluster of at least 30 galaxies. Other clusters could contain as many as thousands of galaxies. The Guinness Book of World Records states that in June 1994, a group of cocoon-shaped clusters of galaxies were discovered. The distance across the group of galaxies was calculated at 600 million light years. Now imagine how long it would take to cross such a vast distance by airplane. Guinness Book of World Records also states that the most remote object ever seen by man appears to be over 13.2 billion light years away. Our finite minds can never begin to comprehend distances this immense. We've yet to glimpse the ends of the galaxy clusters, let alone the end of the universe. Now, yet God can measure all of this with the span of his hand. To top it off, the psalmist says this in Psalm 147, 4 through 5. He, God, counts the number of the stars. He calls them by name. Great is our God and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Don't miss this for one second. Not only can he count the billions of the billions of stars, he knows the name of every one. Don't you know he knows your name? No wonder the psalmist exclaimed, his understanding is infinite. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Beyond all that, who wouldn't trust a God like this? He is not an incapable God. He is as able as you allow him to be. He is as big as you will allow him to be. And he is able to make the impossible happen. But you've got to learn to change your view of who God is. And if you do, you're going to learn next week what happens when you do and how we can release him to be the God who takes the impossible and makes it possible. One more time. This Christmas is your God, the God of the impossible. It's an interesting thing. But Lori, I thought about you this week when I thought about the God of the impossible. You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> but the God of the impossible said. Mm. A mother living in a tenement, as I close, a tenement house, went shopping for groceries. While she was in the store, a fire engine went racing by. She wondered to herself, is this fire engine going to my home? She had left her baby asleep at home. For getting her groceries, she ran toward home. Her building had ho fire hoses aimed at it. It was burning up like a matchbox. Box. Rushing to the chief, she cried, my baby is up there. He shouted back to her, it would be suicide for anyone to go up there now, it's too late. A young fireman standing near him volunteered, Chief, I have a little baby at home. If my house were on fire, I would want someone to go up and save my baby, I'll go. The young fireman climbed the stairs, he got the baby, threw her into the rescue net, and just as he did, the house collapsed and he was burned to death. Now see the scene 20 years later at a graveside. 20-year-old woman is sobbing softly. Before her at the head of this grave is the statue of a fireman. A man stopping asks re respectfully, was that your father? She replies, no. Was it your brother? No, she says. That's the man who died for me. Thank you, Jesus. One miracle, 2,000 plus years ago, was not meant to be an isolated miracle, but to culminate in the ultimate miracle that God would become man 
He would live among us. He would die. He would be buried. He would rise from the grave. That we might be able to declare, whoever will. That's the man who died for me. Bless his name. It is the greatest gift of all. As I close, that's where it all ends. It began 2,000 plus years ago, but it culminates at this place. Let me tell you what I have been thinking about, and not in a morbid way, but I've been thinking the longer you live, the, long, the more you realize how short life really is. And I want you to understand, I just want to outpace my grandmother by one year. She hit 103, I want 104. So when I get to heaven, I can say, Grandma, thank you for handing down the genes. But here's what I know. If by the grace of God I should live such a life, the longer I live, the more I realize how short life is. Another one of those empty statements we make is that when someone passes away, especially young, they had all of their life ahead of us. Let me tell you something. No matter your age, you've got all of your life ahead of you because all of your life depends on not how long you live, but when you die. And since no one knows when they're going to die, we all have our life ahead of us. The question is not, do I have life ahead of me? The question is, am I prepared for the life that is ahead of me? That's the question. And watching by stream or in the sanctuary, every head bowed, every eye closed, you'd say, Bishop, I want to make sure that's the peace of God that I have in my heart and life. I confess that I'm a sinner, I have need of a Savior. And the Bible says if I will ask him to forgive my sins and come into my heart and live, he will do that and I shall be saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this sanctuary and you need to do that, if you're watching by live streaming, you need to do that. Just open up your heart and repeat these words after me. Would you say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He came to earth as a baby. He grew to be a man. He lived among us. He lived like us, yet without sin. He was crucified. He was buried in the grave. But on the third day, he rose from that grave. And because of that resurrection, if I confess my sin, if I believe with my heart that Jesus is the Savior of the world and ask him to come into my life, I shall be saved. Today I do that. Thank you, Father, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Would you give glory to the God who died for you? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, Eagle Heights family. And thank you for joining us. As we prepare to worship the Lord with this tie and our offerings. Amen. Amen. Our special offering this Sunday is for the radio ministry. The radio ministry beyond the walls on WEZE 590 has reached many lives. And because of the radio ministry over the years, people's lives have been changed for eternity. If you missed Christ in Christmas, you missed the purpose of the season. The radio ministry is just not a radio program. It's God's living word being sent out, church. And where the word of God is sent, lives do change. Partner with us and help us reach lives for Christ. And, and let me tell you, another way that you can bless a family in having a Merry Christmas this year. Every year we have a ministry that's called Gifts for Kids. 
It only takes $30 to sponsor one child for Christmas. Your support will provide a child with a toy or even a clothing gift. If we, listen, we have over about 100 gifts to cover. If 100 of us give $30, we got it covered. You may be able to sponsor more than one child. Just know that the greater the sponsorship, the more children we can reach. Your giving will bless a family, a family that can't afford to buy a gift for their children, whether they're here at Eagle Heights Church or at a shelter that we bless every year. You can give in person, you can give online. It's very simple and quick to give online. You just click child or you click for children. And that, just as you give your offerings. Let me just leave this. What a great opportunity we have to make a Merry Christmas for someone. Amen? We have an opportunity to make it a Merry Christmas for someone by presenting Jesus Christ, the gift of God, to someone else and also by sponsoring children. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen? Praise God. Let me pray. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And Father God, thank you for being a miracle-working God. My God, Father, I pray, dear God, thank you. Father, I pray, Lord, that as we sow into your kingdom, you would make it multiply. But Father, bless your people. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we close, I got a question. Is, has anybody else done what I'm about to confess? I say every year, I ain't going in that mall just before Christmas. <laughs> Yesterday, we were in the mall, ran into the Lopez's, ran into their son, Robert, and I declared anew, I ain't going in that mall the rest of this season till after Christmas. Now, by the help of God, I'm going to keep my word, but here's what I want to express as I say this. We went to a couple of malls, and I can't believe even in this time that we're in right now, the clusters of people, malls just packed. My wife and I were going to go into Costco and I looked at her, I said, do we really want to do this? This is like taking your life into your own hand. She said, do you want to go in? I said, no, we ain't going in there, not today. We'll skip work and go when everybody else is at work. But you know what it said to me? That in the midst of all we're going through, Oh, that we would recognize that though some are struggling, we're still blessed in this nation. That's what all those people said to me. And some of them don't even know they're blessed. It's our job to get to them. But this moment right now, it is our job to acknowledge that in spite of it all, the grace of God is on us. We are blessed and highly favored. And here's why. Because He is with us. If you believe that, sing with us. Say His name. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Oh yes. Beautiful Savior. Glorious God. 
Pray that this message has warmed your spirit and touched your heart. As we continue on in this Christmas season, we want to remind you that you can sponsor a child for Gifts for Kids by visiting our website, ehconline.org. Click the Gifts for Kids tab and you can make a child's Christmas wish come true just for $30. Register to attend in person by visiting our website as well for one of three services at 8.30, 10.15, and 12 p.m. If you are unable to attend, you can continue to live stream with us right here at 8.30 and 10.15 every Sunday. See you next week.